Hi, welcome to KB Time. I'm your host, and today we're going to be discussing uh, the Double Loop, Raging Wolf Bobs, The Wave, Turtle Beach, all of that. If those are now ping-ponging in your memory banks and you're thinking, I know that, what do I know that from? You know it from Geauga Lake. And I've got with me a very special guest that we never thought we would actually uh, find someone who knew all this, but one of the gentlemen who ran Geauga Lake for almost 30 years, Dale Van Voris. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for being here. Now, when you folks bought the park in 1969, what it had already been there for uh, 80 years or so. What made you decide, and we've talked about this a little bit before, what made you decide, um, we're going to buy Geauga Lake? It was you and, I think, three partners, right? Right. There was three of us. We all worked at Cedar Point. Mm -hmm. um, I had worked at Price Waterhouse right after I got out of graduate school. And my boss at Price Waterhouse happened to live in Aurora, Ohio. And he said, if you ever want to introduce to the owners, I know them. And at Cedar Point, uh, I got to get to know the, uh, the other three fellows were Earl Gascoigne, Gar Gasper Lococo, and Milford Jacobson. And so at one point in time, we decided that uh, we might want to investigate this. Mm -hmm. And so we did. And that started in probably, oh, January of 2000, or 1968. Mm -hmm. And it took us until um, October of 1968 to get a deal to okay. buy the park. Wow. And the deal was we'd buy a million and a half, for a million and a half dollars, we'd put half down, we had to put $50,000 up front as earnest money, and we proceeded from there to um, find financing and we used the Ohio company out of Columbus, and we had a small public company that we were floating a million dollar bond stock issue that uh, came out and provided us the ability to take over Geauga Lake. And we, the actual day we took it over was April 1st, 1969. Pretty good. And the park opened uh, probably like Memorial Day that year, no, right? No, 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 no. The park opened the last weekend in April. Oh. Oh, very cool. And we'd, down, we'd been down to working before we actually mm -hmm. took over the operation. And naturally, the opening day, it snowed. <laughs> of course. We had about three inches of snow in the midway, so oh we didn't even attempt to open. No. <laughs> but eventually, you had a good run of about 30 years. And in that time, you added a lot of things. Talk to me about what the park was like in 69 versus uh, when you folks sold okay. it. Okay. The entire park was inside the roller coaster, the wooden roller coaster. Mm -hmm. Back then it was called the Cyclone, mm -hmm. and we renamed it the Big Dipper eventually. Mm -hmm. But all of it was within, people parked up against, and there's many pictures of this parking right. lot, up against the roller coaster itself, and the main entrance was underneath, underneath. the arch of the coaster. Yeah. And so there was a lot of rides. Mm -hmm. uh, the midways had all been blacktop by this time. Okay. Uh, so we didn't have to do any of that. Mm -hmm. The ballroom, which used to be a roller rink, was intact. Mm -hmm. um, so at the other end of the park, uh, there was three rides or two rides in the swimming pool that was built in the 20s. Mm -hmm. And that's where Johnny Weissmiller set, I don't know how many records right. in the 30s swimming there. Yeah. But it had been filled in such a way that you could put rides on top of it and you'd walk instead of up to a ride, you'd walk right straight on. Mm. Um, good. And they had games buildings and refreshments and picnic shelters, and, and, but it was all between the roller coaster and the lake. Pretty good. And you could, at the time, if you wanted to, just walk in, and then you, did you not, you paid per ride initially. When, That's, when cor you first, That's correct. Yeah, so you, you folks were able to switch it to what we all know now, where here you buy your ticket for the day and you can go do whatever you want. Right. For free. Yep. And, and, and you, there was also, you mentioned the ballroom, there was concerts. Yes. Right? You'd have concerts, but then you'd have a, the big DJ uh, uh, from the AM stations come out, right? Right. So right. how did that uh, attract people and bring them in? Well, it just it was uh, Wixie, uh, Nickel Days okay. was an example, example of one of those. And we had it the first year we were there and maybe the second year, and then we discontinued it. And it was a nickel a ride. That was mm -hmm. the big thing to come and do that. And uh, Larry Morrow, I believe, was the DJ at the time. And he had talked to me a couple times in the 70s, and he said, oh, we had 115,000 people at Geauga Lake. Mm -hmm. And I kept telling him, Larry, we can't handle 25,000 people, <laughs> let alone 115. Yeah. <laughs> so, and our biggest capacity crowd over the 20, 
27 or 28 years that we ran in the park, uh, we got 31,000 people in the park. Wow. And that's after we expanded the park. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we figured if one more person came in, someone had to fall in the lake. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> was there a special promotion that day or you just... No, it just happened to be uh, one of those days that everything seemed to hit. Everything hit. Now, you were also telling me at one point that, uh, and I remember going there many times for my parents' company picnics, and that was a huge part of the, uh, the admission, uh, the business at Geauga Lake, was it not? That's correct. Mm -hmm. one, of our, one of our best things that we did to guarantee we had business is we would have group outings and 54 of our 54 percent of our attendance came from pre-scheduled pre-booked outings mm -hmm. so what this buys you is on a saturday or sunday which is your biggest days mm -hmm. if it's raining the people come whether it's uh whatever the name of the picnic the illuminating company or whatever it is mm -hmm. because it's just like you going to a cleveland browns football game mm -hmm. and it's snowing you're going to go no matter you what take happens it that day they show up. So we had at least half of our normal crowd mm -hmm. pre-booked. Pretty good. Now, we had to give pretty good discounts for that to happen, mm -hmm. but, it, but it gave us a steady cash flow as opposed to uh, if we had to go to SeaWorld, they didn't have near the amount of book, booked outings, and their attendance might be 10% of what they would normally get on a rainy weekend. And I have uh, more vague memories of SeaWorld than of Geauga Lake, but it seems like Geauga Lake, there was more... Uh, I guess today we'd call it interactive, more hands-on, more rides, where SeaWorld was more that you're seeing things. It was yes. more like a big aquarium of shows, that sort of thing. Well, SeaWorld came to the Jogger Lake area, mm -hmm. um, not by accident. Right. Uh, Earl Gascoigne, who was director of marketing at Cedar Point at the time, was working with George, George Millay, the founder of SeaWorld, and they had one park out in San Diego, and what they, they were going to build a second park on land owned by Cedar Point mm -hmm. uh, up near Sandusky. Mm -hmm. Well, Earl Gascoigne convinced George Millay to come look at what we had and what we had for variety closer to the express, the, the turnpike, closer to a major population. And uh, we, we signed a deal in late 1969 and by 1971, SeaWorld was up and running. Wow, that was pretty fast. That was fast. And, uh, we had a covenants in our purchase agreement that we would never have any kind of live shows, fish or otherwise, and they had in their covenants, they would never put in any amusement park rides. At SeaWorld, and at you sea wouldn't World. have shows at Geauga Lake. Yeah. Now, uh, and I've always been curious about this, I don't imagine this ever came up, but was there ever any talk of filming, uh, was it Jaws 3 or 4? One of them is at a SeaWorld. Was there ever any talk of doing it up here? I have not, no? uh, not that I know of. Just curious. Well, yeah. Now, you know, Ohio's become big for uh, tax credits for sure. filming and whatnot, so I didn't know 30 years ago. They said, instead of San Diego, what if we go up to Ohio? But <laughs> I, I guess not. I don't know. I, it didn't happen while I was there. No, not while you were there. What was a typical day like for you and your, your duties uh, when you would get to the park? And we're talking in the summer when the park was, was in full okay. swing. Um, well, I, I was 27 years old when we bought the park. I was chief financial officer. Mm -hmm. We were a small public company. I would get there by nine o'clock in the morning and the first two seasons, that was every day of the summer. I would do a lot of things that had to be finished up from the night before his activity. And I would about, as the park closed, I would be part of the, the group that was counting money. Mm -hmm. And many times I would get home between one and two o'clock in the morning. Wow. And so that, uh, my kids didn't know who dad was no. in a lot of ways. <laughs> and at the end of every, every season that I was there, mm -hmm. I took uh, my children out of, the, out of uh, school mm -hmm. and we went on a vacation together oh, for a that's week. that's good, nice. Uh, Do you remember where you went, any of those? Oh yeah, went, we went up to the French River in Canada. Wow. Where, where there was a cabin that we had, what we could use and that's mm -hmm. what we did. Yeah, so no amusement parks on the vacation. <laughs> no, 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 it was solitary confinement with yeah, dad. I bet, you pr they probably needed that. Uh, eventually you said uh, you were able to bring the kids and I imagine they must have worked there at some point. And I think you said your, your daughter's rehearsal dinner. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, yeah. you brought them into the park somewhat, did you not? Oh, every, all, all four of my kids and I have a, the oldest is a daughter and the rest are boys. At 14 years old, they became midway sweeps. Mm. And s some of them went into the food uh, end of it for a while. Some of them went into games, mm -hmm. but they all ended up in the accounting department and they all learned what dad did. Mm -hmm. And they had, uh, whether it was counting money or making entries for bookkeeping, et cetera, they all learned 
how that end of the world worked. Pretty good. And did they all eventually pursue that for their careers? Uh, no. <laughs> no, <not laughs> no, <at all. laughs> no, none of them did. Yeah. Uh, not that they wouldn't like to, because right. they have lots of good memories of working there. I'm sure, I'm sure. Yeah. So when you worked there, I mentioned some of the rides at the top that uh, were added, some of the attractions. How did you folks decide you know, Northeast Ohio could use the wave or something like that. Did you, did you watch other parks? Was it a, was there, were there Imagineers like they talk about at Disney or how did it work? Well, we would have among the senior staff mm -hmm. at Geauga Lake, and when we had more than one park, they would all be included. We would have a two day get together and we would talk about what do we need to do for the next year. Mm -hmm. And that usually happened in October uh, or November. And we would get down to these things. Um, we added like the wave pool. Uh, I had become the CEO of the company in August of 2000, I mean, 1982. Okay. And I had hired a fellow named Jeff Lococo, who was Gaspar Lococo's nephew. Hmm. But he had worked at Cedar Point. He had worked for Marriott in uh, Chicago at their amusement park. And he was a marketing individual. And he's the one who came up with starting out with Butch High Tide, the water park. And as the water park became very, very uh, an integral part of the park. Uh, we just, he, and, uh, he and a couple of the other department heads had explored um, out in um, Arizona. They had a wave pool like we put at Geauga Lake. Oh, wow. And the company that built that wave pool had been sold to a group out of Mansfield, Ohio. Hmm. And we were their first wave pool after after the one out in uh, Tempe, Arizona is where it's at. Oh, very cool. And it had been there for 15 or 20 years. Yeah. But uh, we had some exciting times. We were first going to make uh, that work pneumatically mm -hmm. uh, and open the gates at the bottom of the big tank mm -hmm. so the wave would come out under the wall and over a reef and create the wave. Ooh. And that didn't work, and they had to go to a mechanical system. Mm. And... Um, and I'll never forget it. I was, stop, I was standing on, up on that wave, or up on the tank, and we made the first wave, and it was a beauty. <laughs> it was a beauty. <laughs> and it kept coming and going. It goes to the end of the pool, over the end of the pool, <laughs> wiped out all the shrubbery. Oh, no. <laughs> and all the freshly laid sod, and it all went into the lake. Oh, no. <laughs> so we had to do adjustments or two. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm <laughs> sure. Wow, that was super popular, I remember, and uh, there was commercials and everything. Yes. Uh, things like that, and I mentioned some of the coasters, uh, the mind eraser. When, uh, during the time you had, I guess, Cedar Point and maybe Shady Lake would have been th the major competitors that, that were close by. Uh, was there, what was the relationship like in staying on top of things and staying competitive? Our goal was that we would keep our prices for admission to the park at about 60% of whatever Cedar Point oh, did. Okay. So we were the low cost alternative and we would, that's how we got our group business and we got a lot, lots of people. Um, we would take a look at the industry and see what was out there mm -hmm. that was exciting. Uh, the mind eraser we did not put in. That was after that us. That was after you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But we put in the Bob's Coaster, mm -hmm. and that came out of. We got the blueprint for the Bob's Coaster, and it was in Riverside Park in Chicago, hmm. and it was built by Philadelphia Toboggan. We got the blueprints for it, and we decided we were going to put the Bob's Coaster in, mm -hmm. and it was. It's one of those things that worked out real well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the same way with starting the water park and saying that. We looked at putting a major improvement every s other year. Mm -hmm. The corkscrew coaster. We were supposed to have the very first one. Yeah. And thank goodness we didn't. And that's like 1966. Okay. And I had gone out to see. They were testing the coaster in the in aero development and... Um, California mm -hmm. at their plant. They had one up working and uh, the head of our maintenance department and our operations department, uh, Jim Mickle, uh, and I went out there to see this. Well, I was going to ride the coaster too, but I, I had, they, they called me into the office and said, we got a problem. We said, we, we told you it would be $400,000 for the, the corkscrew. It's now $600,000. So... <laughs> Long story short, I, I called my partners and we agreed, no, we don't want it. Yeah. We sell it to somebody else. So they sold it to Knott's Farm 
and thank goodness we didn't buy it because they had enough trouble with it. Knott's Berry Farm eventually had to put over a million and a half dollars in, wow. repla in, re in fixing the corkscrew so it would keep running. Hmm. And it's only been about maybe eight or 10 years ago that they went out of, they, told, they, they totally shut the corkscrew down. Yeah, oh my goodness. The next year we put in the double loop looping coaster. Mm -hmm. Okay, there'd never been a double looping coaster built in the world. Yeah. Uh, there were single looping coasters. Sure. And a, or things that would take you up down, upside down. Um, I've got a motion picture that shows some of this from 1917. Hmm. And you would get up on a, um, on a platform, it was about as high as the ceiling in here, about 16 feet. Yeah. And you would put, get into a little thing, cart, and you would go down and the gravity would take you through the loop. Well, this was a Coney Island, New York, and after the second season, they did away with it because it damaged too many guests. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's the nicest way of saying yeah. people fell on their head. Yeah. Because they hadn't put underpinning wheels to hold the thing on mm. in case there was not enough weight. But the double looping coaster was a real bonanza for us. Yeah. And the same company that built the corkscrew built it. Hmm. And so we put it up, and that year we had people from all over the world coming to see it yeah and then it just amazing. expanded and now you have so many configurations oh, of, sure. of the coasters and double yeah. looping and corkscrews and butterflies in them and mm. everything else all sorts of things sure wow so uh all of this was going going well and everything and and then the late 90s come and you decided to sell was it an offer you couldn't refuse or or what was happening well um it was 1995 we sold okay okay and uh, we decided to do that as, as a member of the board, uh, that it was time to do that. And so we, we just uh, put it out there and this group out of Oklahoma City uh, who owned three small amusement parks and they were grossing half of what we were hmm. because by that time we had already bought Dar we had already bought Darien Lake, we had developed Wyandotte Lake at the Columbus Zoo and we had Jaga and we were grossing over $50 million a year. Wow. So it was a series of the, ma of the, of the minnow swallowing the whale, so mm. to speak. Yeah. And Lowerman Brothers financed the project and financed that company. It was Premier Parks, is what the name of the company, mm. and financed that company to buy lots of amusement parks and finally Six Flags. Mm. And they bought SeaWorld, they bought the hotel up in Aurora, yeah. uh, they bought the campground in Aurora. Uh, but after they, uh, they did all this good stuff, they, they bought Six Flags and then changed the name to Six Flags World of Adventures, and mm -hmm. every park got a different Six Flags name. Right, right, yeah. yeah. And did you ever go back after you sold to any of the parks oh, yeah. up here? You did? Oh, yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't bittersweet or anything? No. Oh, no. well, that's good. No, no, no. It, okay. it was sad when they started doing things that we knew they would never get, do, they would never get away with doing, mm -hmm. and it eventually caught up to them. And one of the things, um, they let the city buses from Cleveland come into the Jogger Lake and SeaWorld. Hmm. And we had determined with SeaWorld we would never do that because we, we thought you should have your own method of transportation to get there okay. to be our customer. Mm -hmm. And so that's what, and so it just, it was one crazy thing after another they did. And then they tried to go head to head with Cedar Point. Yeah, they put true. $30 million worth of stuff into Jogger Lake. Yeah. And they had all kinds of debt. Cedar Point at that time had almost no debt. Hmm. And you can't, com you, you can't go head to head with something like that. No. Uh, Do you think though, it, I mean, conceivably, because you mentioned the location, Geauga Lake's a lot closer to a metro area and a big airport yes. than Cedar Point is. So conceivably it should have worked to, hmm. to try and pump up, at the time, they had, by then they had combined the parks, I think, Geauga and SeaWorld, yeah. right? Yeah. Yes. So they'd made one giant park. Conceivably that could have worked to go head to head with Cedar Point. But why didn't it, in your opinion? In my opinion, um, <coughs> they were trying to get Cedar Point's customer. Mm. And Cedar Point had better attractions than what these people did. I got you. And they, I mean, they were the roller, co they're the roller coaster capital of the world. Mm -hmm. And that's serious. They, they've been voted the number one amusement park in the world, I don't know how many times. Yeah. And that's sitting right in Sandusky, Ohio. Right. Not too far. And it's, it's tough to go head to head against somebody like that. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and Cedar Point was not only drawing from the Cleveland, Akron, Canton market, they were drawing from Indianapolis, De uh, Detroit, Toledo, Detroit, Toledo, 
uh, Fort Wayne, yeah. uh, in addition to picking people off of the uh, turnpike coming cross country. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a good point. They, uh, yeah, New York to Chicago, where else are you going to stop? That's right. a good place to stop. Huh. Well, I never thought of any of that. So <laughs> this is why you were running the park for so long and not me. Right. Uh, so then eventually, of course, as we know, the history and things wound down and then uh, there was the, the water park. Uh, was really the last remnant. Did you ever go to the, when it was just the water park? No. No, yeah, I never, I never did either. The whole time when you were there for almost 30 years, what, what are some things, memories that stick out, you know, deals that you made, or you mentioned the wave, but uh, uh, attractions. I know they had the, the Rolling Stones IMAX film was there at one time. Yeah. Uh, what are some things that just stick out even now, you think back, and you're like, I can't believe we accomplished that. Well, we started an Oktoberfest. Okay, I remember and that. And the year before we started that, I had gone to Germany with my wife and we were visiting the Oktoberfest. Mm -hmm. And it was a whole different atmosphere. There they had tents with great big stationary wooden decover, uh, entranceways. But inside you sat in benches like picnic benches and you went back a little bit and you were touching the guy at the next mm -hmm. table. Yeah. It was that close. Um, they had a band that came down from partly on the season of the the ceiling of the tent and it was maybe a six or eight piece band playing german music and mm -hmm. polkas um they had a real small dance floor they had if the women wanted to dance and that's primarily who did this they got up on the tables and <laughs> they were doing the chicken dance yeah. and <laughs> even my wife did that wow so <laughs> But it was such a good time, yeah. and they did, they did then a unique atmosphere that we decided we'd try that at Geauga Lake. And well, the first three years, we didn't make any money. Hmm. Was so it I, too much beer? People drank you under the table? No, 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 okay. no, no nothing like that. <laughs> so I, I called in the department heads at that time and said, okay, if we don't make money this year, it's the end of it. Hmm. Well, I think they cooked the books. <laughs> they wanted to keep it going. <laughs> they wanted to keep it going. And it, it, it did end up to be very, a very nice attraction yeah. for uh, mid-September. I remember that. But we had, you know, there was always something exciting going on. And yeah. uh, we had some crazy uh, things. The office, when I f we first bought the park, was in the center of the park, and it was an old farmhouse. Hmm. And the wooden roller coaster, and I was in that building, and the wooden roller coaster went right behind my office, about 20 feet away. And it was like a Tuesday night, and it was 1971 or 72, one of the two. And all of a sudden, I heard this screeching noise and people yelling. And I go out and hear the roller coaster track had worn out. And only, it's only about maybe an inch thick. Wow. And it's about that wide mm -hmm. and somehow worn out. And anyway, we got very lucky. God was on our side. A piece of the roller coaster track had come up through the back seat of the coaster, and it was doing one of these. Wow. And the only people in the coaster train were in the front seat, and nobody got hurt. Oh, wow. It just came to a screeching halt. Yeah. Never forget that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> and that thing survived until two, three years ago. Yes. It was so well built. Well, they built it in 1925, yeah. and it opened in approximately, it was a Miller coaster. Mm -hmm. The to coaster, and I, we originally had the books and all the fancy handwriting from that era wow. uh, in the bookkeeping stuff, and it cost $50,000. Hmm. It was built by the Miller Coaster Company in Dayton, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And now Dayton, Ohio had the National Coaster Company too at the same time. Yeah, it was big down there. <laughs> big down there. Um, we, in 41, there was a, a, a mini tornado took down part of the high hill, hmm. and it had to be replaced. And then, we were there uh, in 1976. We determined it had to be something had to happen because it was painted white, mm -hmm. and you'd have a beautiful square nut. Mm -hmm. If you hit the nut with a hammer, the only thing holding the nut there was the paint and something the size of a thumbtack. Oh boy! So we totally tore it apart, put in new wood, put in new everything, put it back together, and we had a company. Um, they were in Twinsburg that made special paint for us. Hmm. Well, the special paint was so good that if you got a nail hole or a screw hole in it, it would let the water in, but not out. Pretty good. 1984 or 83, hmm. seven or eight years, all we got out of it, we had to rebuild the coaster again. Hmm. This time we didn't paint it, we used pressure treated wood yeah. and left it, let it age for a couple of years and then we stained it. And that's the wood, that's the coaster that 
was there. It was, and if they had maintained it, it would have probably still be standing. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. So uh, real quick here, uh, we're, we're short on time. The uh, materials you said, you had the ledgers and everything. Yes. Where is all that material now? Uh, before we even sold the park, it disappeared. Mm. We don't know whether someone took it or they just threw it out and figured it was old junk. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, we did have that. We had lots of pictures and uh, memorabilia and all kind, lots of things from that hadn't been used in years, but they were stuck in the attic of the house or they mm. were stuck. Jogger Lake had cottages that went all the way around the lake. Oh yeah. And they would, and this was prior to the amusement park coming there. Mm -hmm. There was still eight of those cottages left, of which there was four of them that had people in it, and four of them that were just storage areas. Oh wow! <laughs> and they were Sears and Roebuck yeah. prefab cottages. Oh yeah, catalog houses. And mm. so the, some of the stuff was in there, and you must have things at home still. I have a few things, not yeah, many. No. Uh, most of that stuff stayed right with the park because mm. it belonged there. Yeah. And, uh, so someday maybe it'll turn up in somebody's garage yeah. or. The Sorry. only thing I've got in any completeness is I, we were a public company from 1969 through December 31st of 1987. Mm -hmm. And I have all the annual reports that we had uh, filed oh. with the SEC cool. with all the pictures and stuff from each year yeah. starting in 69. All right. Well, save those somehow. Get them preserved. You've got to do well, something with that. <laughs> who knows who yeah. will want them. Maybe someone who's watching this will find a way to preserve them or something. Yes. We thank you so much for everything that you did with Geauga Lake and... Well, we had a great time doing it. And I mean, we had a ball. And we had department head parties every... Or, or, or staff parties every Sunday night after the park closed. We ate up all the extra food from the weekend. Oh, wow. And we drank a beer or two. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> you have to. You have to. Blow off some steam. Yeah. That's great. Well, thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. No problem. Thanks Good to be with much. you. Want a hundred rides?